It's being touted as the biggest drug bust in Canadian history and probably the most dramatic. A story covering two continents, a plane chase, and up to a billion dollars worth of cocaine. This was a big case. I considered it the largest case I'd ever worked. We did not know anything about uh, the pilot. 23 years for the pilot Boulanger. His name is Raymond Boulanger. Raymond Boulanger. Well, I don't forget it. It was a hell of a lot of fun, let me tell you. It was quite a ride. I was involved in a lot of different operations. Operations supervised by the CIA. I used to think the CIA were the good guys, and then you start to realize the more you work for them, well, we're not the good guys. We're actually the bad guys. I talked with Pablo many times, and he was well into the CIA. They were all in bed with him. Cocaine. <laughs> That's when it got interesting. It was considered one of the biggest traffickers at that time. They asked me if I can help him, and I did. The cartels have a history of violence, a wide trail of destruction and death. Bad people. <laughs> this was, it's the far west. It's all part of the game. My grandfather said there's three ways you can live life. You can lead, you can follow, or you can get the fuck out the way. I prefer to lead. <laughs> Quebec may be the biggest ever. The enormous value of the plane's cargo that was crammed in here, that's just one part of the story. This guy contacted me and asked me if I thought it would be possible to fly a large load of cocaine from South America to Canada. I said, yeah, of course, it's no big deal. The goal was to put 4,000 kilos of cocaine on one flight. And that's it, you're on your way. We were at work, we had just gotten there, it was 8.30 or 9 o'clock, something like that, when we got the call from Ottawa. It was about a plane that had left Colombia that was supposed to go to the U.S., but the Americans noticed it was actually headed to Canada. So I just pulled off to the right here and parked the airplane with the nose facing west, and uh, we got out of the airplane and started looking where the hell everybody was. I was standing here, 300 clicks in the bush north of Montreal, and shit, five tons of cocaine, 20 below zero, and there's nobody here. I couldn't believe it. It's insane. I never saw anything that stupid. I got a call from a gentleman here in Montreal, a representative of the local mafia, trying to get an aircraft that would be able to fly a load directly from Columbia to Canada. And they had problems that they'd gone through a couple of pilots who couldn't do it. They'd gone through a couple of attempts that failed. So at one point, this guy contacted me and asked me if, if I thought it would be possible to fly a large load of uh, cocaine from South America to, to Canada. And I said, yeah, of course, it's no big deal. John Raymond, John Raymond Boulanger. He was approached by the Montreal Mafia to carry out a cocaine delivery operation from Colombia. Those people had already sponsored two operations over the previous months, and they had failed. They didn't want the importation to fail, like in previous attempts. So, they were looking for a pilot that was capable of getting the job done. We're considered, myself and the group that I'm in, to be in the top 4% of the best pilots in the world. Well, I asked for $50 million. And they said, yep, no problem. It's just not a game for amateurs. You know, it's very dangerous, and you have to be highly skilled or just somewhat a little bit crazy, maybe, uh, along the edges. But, you know, there's not that many pilots that have the skill to be able to do that. Because, you know, the, the people had tried and said, they said it was impossible, it couldn't be done. And I said, that's ridiculous. Of course it could be done. There's no such thing as impossible. It just takes a little longer to do the impossible, that's all. But they had tried it a couple of times and they failed. So that becomes a question of competence.
I went up myself and examined the runways. I took two of their people with me. I stopped at Casey on the way down, and I told him, that's where you're going to be. This is where you're going to be. Casey, we used to fly there a lot. We're going to land there and go fishing in the river beside it. During the Cold War, the Canadian Armed Forces built military installations in the north of Canada. One of them was the Casey Runway. It was an emergency landing strip. It was very, very long and isolated in the middle of nowhere. For operations like the one Raymond was leading, to import drugs, it was perfect. He also had to have intimate knowledge of the landing conditions at Casey to be able to land a plane that large with that type of a load on it. Uh, he had to be familiar with that particular runway and, and what preparations were necessary uh, to make it successful. So it's our belief that Mr. Bollinger was probably the sole architect, at least for the transportation, aviation transportation part of this project. always confidence that everything's going to go well, you know. We, we, we plan things and we do strategic thinking, so nothing is done haphazard here. The idea was to do a test flight first to make sure it could be done successfully. So they did a first flight with a King Air and 500 kilos of cocaine. I did the first flight successfully, no problem at all. It went quite well. I left Columbia uh, and over Casey, I just spiraled, landed at the airport, and there was my guy, and we unloaded. I took some fuel on, and, and we split. We were there, I think, probably, well, you could say 20 minutes, but, you know, some say 15, some say 18, but um, let's say 20 minutes. I was back in Columbia in less than 23 hours, one, less than one day. The goal, eventually, over the following weeks, was to fly in with a much bigger load, 4,000 kilos of cocaine in one flight. To transport 4,000 kilos of cocaine, they needed a bigger plane than a King Air. He decided on a Convair. The sponsors bought the Convair from a company called Avesca in Colombia. Avesca was a cargo company based out of El Dorado Airport, the main international airport in Bogota. It was owned by uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Luis Carlos Herrera Lascano. Luis uh, Carlos Herrera was a pilot. He started in the cocaine business back in the 70s and in the early 80s. Avesca was flying loads of cocaine. The connection was there, the conspiracy was there, the cocaine planes were there. So we knew Avesca was the transportation air wing for the cartels. I had done flights with Convairs many times before doing the Casey one. I knew that was a perfectly good airplane for that. Convair 580 was modified with General Motors turbines on it. Very powerful engines and it's quite capable of carrying considerable overload. The main example and what we would see is that they would try to increase the capabilities of the aircraft. They wanted to carry uh, larger loads, heavier loads for a greater distance. And one way that they were able to go the greater distance was to add additional fuel to the plane. To me, it looked horrifying. In my view, it was a very risky uh, proposition and uh, one that would take a very unique pilot to challenge that type of a, a risk. Or maybe you just weren't uh, quite as rational as a regular pilot would be. I'd done several flights to Mexico with Convairs 580. It was an excellent aircraft for that. So typically what they would do is, when they were flying cocaine, they would disguise the plane by removing all the data tags. The identification tags were like the serial number on your automobile. A lot of the guys would rent their aircraft out. They just changed the registration numbers on the aircraft for the flight. Well, they don't want to identify the aircraft directly, so 
they, when they send an aircraft out for that, the serial numbers are removed, the camouflage airplane, you can't really, it's hard to detect the actual ownership. So, November 12th, 1992, about five days before the infamous KC flight, Raymond Boulanger went to see his friend Guy Bernier on the south shore of Montreal. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I had a company out in Saint-Jean. We did maintenance of Hydro-Quebec planes, Convair 580s. One day, Raymond came to take a look in the hangar. There was a Convair that was almost a replica of the one he was going to use to fly to Casey. As a joke, I put it on one that was pulled out of commission. I saw it in the hangar in Saint-Jean. The aircraft had been decommissioned. It was just being parted in pieces, had nothing left of it. And the registration had been cancelled, obviously, but the letters were still there, so... For him, oh, it was easy to take the letters and put them on another plane. <laughs> the letters just stuck in my mind, that's all. They said, well, give us a Canadian registration. It just came to my mind. I, well, I'd go stick that on it. It's a bit of a joke, really. Sick sense of humor. I thought, yep, that's him. <laughs> There was a first meeting with the Montreal Mafia sponsoring the operation at the Champ de Mars metro station. I met the representative from the Mafia, Montreal Mafia. They're Sicilian, those ones. If you go use the other ones, Calabres, they're Italians, but the Sicilians are Sicilians. They, like, they don't like to be called Italians. <laughs> but I guess it was a mix of all of them in there. They had Calabres, they had Sicilians, whatever, so... I don't even know the one who, who I met, if he was a Calabrese or, his, or a Sicilian, but here it's definitely the Italian Mafia. Yeah, I met with the representative of the Sicilian Mafia, the Jean de Mars, uh, but he brought along with him the guy they had hired to do the pickup. The man that was going to wait for him on the Casey Strip with his accomplices was Christian Deschenes. I wasn't happy about that because I don't like meeting people I don't need to. He started to tell me about his prowess and he'd done this and he'd done that and he'd done that and I told him, quite frankly, I don't give a fuck who you are. You know, I don't want to know you. From that point on, there was a lot of tension between the two men. Well, I didn't really know him. I had no idea who he was, you know. You know, I'm a pretty quick judge of character, and you look somebody in the face, you can tell he's a fraud or not, you know, and this guy was full of shit from the get-go, so. And I saw him when we were, were arraigned in uh, Latouk, when they hauled us up to charge us. And he was in the cell there, the other one. Well, we didn't talk to him. I didn't want him. My Colombians didn't get anywhere near him. They had to keep him in the cell. The Colombians would have killed him. They would have jumped him right there. <laughs> I went to pick up the aircraft for the flight around 5 o'clock in the afternoon in Bogota. They flew the aircraft to the desert, the Guajira. The runway we used in La Guajira was a runway we had used very often in the past when we take off with large aircraft. Heat gets up to 110 degrees in the daytime. You can't take off in 100 degree temperature. There's just no lift in the air, but uh, we always uh, managed somehow. Raymond had three accomplices on board for the Casey flight. My co-pilot was Juan Carlos Montes Restrepo. I had uh, Jose Gonzalez, who was the electrician, and Jorge Rojas, who was the airframe and engine specialist. So that was the crew. The co-pilot got 70, gets $75,000 for a flight like that, and the fellas in the back get 50. The first vehicles that arrive are the ones with the barrels. So they load the barrels on board. There's armed men everywhere. There's two or three hundred of them, and the last thing to arrive is a truck full of drugs. Then they all get in line and chubbly choo, and they take all the drugs out, and then they place them on the side. 4,343 kilos, to be exact. Well, yeah, they would have liked to put more, but that was it. Uh, Any more, like 200 kilos more, I might not have got it off that runway. <laughs> it was that critical. When you think of the amount of drugs on that plane, believe me, most people thought he wouldn't be able to take off. Yes, of course it's dangerous. 
It's what you're paid for. You know, no danger. Everybody'd be doing it. It wouldn't be a big deal, would it? They called yeah, we knew that. Yeah, it was going to be a really tricky flight. My scheduled departure was around 9, 9.15. Well, you'd take all the runway you need, every inch of it, and then you just pull the aircraft off slightly, you let it float off itself, and that's it. You're on your way. So the aircraft did a wonderful job. Took off the early, just like nothing. As soon as his plane left, he got a message that he was being tailed, he was being followed. Well, well I got a call right away telling me that I had a tail. Yeah, it had been less than 10 minutes since takeoff, and they warned us right away. Just after we take off, and another plane took off, there was an informant somewhere. One of the things that uh, I'm still challenged today was to understand how he thought he could have outrun the surveillance, particularly when it included the southern Florida, Caribbean area, and basically uh, NORAD. Shit, he was being followed by the American Air Force along the coast. The whole time, Jesus. There's no way to come up with plan B. But uh, if he knew he was being followed, I don't understand why he wouldn't have diverted to an alternate site or even return back to the jungle. Well, heading back was out of the question. It was far too late. They called me right away and said that they had scanned and picked up the, the slick who had just taken off from Panama. And I said, OK, cool. That's when I decided to opt a few more uh, longitudes to the east. That delayed the flight a little. It also made him cross a violent storm north of Bermuda. Typical North Atlantic storm, rough wind and ice. You get your ass kicked, this is kind of rough. That was your average North Atlantic storm. Ice, strong winds, freezing rain, you name it. <laughs> it's a mishmash of a bunch of things. Very windy and bumpy. You know you're in deep shit when it gets bumpy, and the plane does this. There's turbulence, lots of it. Well, the Colombians had never seen a North Atlantic storm, much less because I don't think they'd been, ever been out of Colombia. A little scared, yeah, particularly the co-pilot. Thought the airplane was going to come apart. Uh, this kind of weather is very unforgiving when people are incompetent. We were in there for about an hour. And then all of a sudden, you just fly out of it, and all the air is all smooth all of a sudden. So it's quite a change. It's all of a sudden, whew, you're just, you're just like you go in the madhouse. You boom, boom, bippity bop, and you're tossed all over the place, and then, boop, you're out. Oh, yeah, you can get up and go in the back. We have our lunch with us and everything. We have a little table set up and everything in the back. Yeah, you have a lot of time to relax here, and you're just cruising along at altitude, heading in one direction, so there's not much going on. And not long after that is when we spotted the... Uh, the Canadian fighter jets. A Convair twin-engine plane took off from Columbia. A few quick phone calls and two CF-18s from Goose Bay, Labrador were up in the air. But he followed me all the way down and I said, oh, that's not going to last very long for you, buddy. So the lower he goes, the faster he burns up his fuel. He left and the other one got closer. And we were just timing how long it was going to take for him to run out of gas. Yeah, we were timing it. How long? 10 minutes? 15? Nah. Eight minutes? Eight minutes, one of my engineers won the bet. It took 12 minutes. So he was supposed to buy lunch when we got by, back to Columbia, but we didn't get back to Columbia. So I just paralleled the river and kept the aircraft at high speed and down, so the other jet pulled right up beside us, flew around us, made circles all around. He went around the plane two or three times, and he got in front, and then he made his way here. Made signs like that to go down, and I just waved at him and said, I'm going forward. It was already critical. He, he was about to run out of fuel. So the other guy decided that was it, it was critical, so he just peeled off, and away he went. They spotted the airplane over New Brunswick, but because of low fuel, the Air Force let it get away. The uh, military pilots landed in Fredericton to refuel. The suspicious plane got away from the police and army. Uh, yeah, that's all mm, part of the job. Uh, it's no big deal. I mean, we get intercepted all the time. Uh, it's no big deal. He must feel that he's got a lot of luck in his life, and the fact that he's still here today, uh, not sure of the word, I don't want to use nonchalant, <laughs> the nonchalant pilot. 
Mr. Bollinger takes an extraordinary amount of risk and has obviously had some success up till this point with that risk. Had he succeeded, I'm convinced there would have been many more flights to KC Canada. It was time to head to KC, but he didn't want to fly through American airspace. If you fly over the United States without permission, you're intruding in American airspace. Wherever you go, they'll come and get you. So what he did was fly north along the New Brunswick main border. During that time, he was flying a very low altitude, about 100 feet above the treetops. We don't transmit on our radios ever. If you transmit a radio signal, they can pick it, they can detect your position immediately. So we don't transmit, make no noise. Approach straight in the runway, I said, I didn't make plan on flying around, taking a look at the scenery. So I approached the runway from far out, flat out at low altitude and headed straight in. And I remember when I reversed the props to slow the airplane down, there was just a big white cloud. And we just disappeared in the big white cloud. And then we started looking around, where the hell is everybody? Nobody here, like a big WTF. Big surprise, nobody here. The Evening News with Suzanne LaBerge. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. This morning, the American FBI signaled the presence of a suspicious airplane flying over the Atlantic approaching Nova Scotia. On November 18th, 1992, I got to the detachment I was stationed at as usual. We were at the office. We got in at 8.30 or 9 o'clock, something like that. We got a call from Ottawa. We didn't get much information. A plane had left Colombia and was headed toward the U.S., but the Americans noticed it was actually headed toward Canada. So we dispatched all our personnel, uh, teams of two. All of the province's detachments were called on, in Gaspé, Setil, and everywhere. All of our RCMP officers were going to check every runway the plane could land on. We left that morning on a military helicopter because I knew about Casey. I was convinced that if this was really happening, they would land at Casey. It's the best place to land, a mile-long asphalt runway. So I just pulled off to the right here and parked the airplane with the nose facing west. And uh, we got out of the airplane and started looking where the hell everybody was. And there was nobody here. I see all the tracks, truck tracks and trailer tracks and skidoo tracks and whatever. Like there's been a lot of activity there, but there's nothing there right now. So we knew that somebody had been there for all the time. And where the hell they were now, I had no idea. What the? <laughs> I'm standing here, 300 clicks in the bush north of Montreal, and shit, five tons of cocaine, 20 below zero, and nobody here. I couldn't believe it. It's insane. I never saw anything that stupid. When Raymond got off the plane and realized Christian Deschain and his associates weren't there, it was a race against the clock. Raymond knew he had to get out of there quickly. At the same time, the police knew that a plane had landed somewhere with cocaine in it. Officers had no idea where it was, but they were in a rush to find it. At the time of the Casey incident, I had two sets of duties at the RCMP. I was part of the criminal intelligence squad in Montreal, and I was part of the tactical intervention team. That morning, around 9 a.m., the head of my tactical team wanted us to meet as soon as possible at the office because there seemed to be an airplane coming in from Colombia that had disappeared. We needed our help to trace it. I was on my way to fix a machine. Uh, at the two and a half mile mark, about all of a sudden, I saw a big plane. It was 
coming down in compression. There was black smoke coming out of the back. I thought, damn it, it's in trouble. I decided to go see what's happening with the plane. Big plane like that? We never seen one land there. Went out on the highway beside there and I hitched right down to the village to go make a phone call, see if we can get some phone calls in. Because we didn't have any cellular phones here at that time. Took a walk onto the, the little road that's over here. I waited and I saw a vehicle coming, so I flagged him down. They had gotten off the plane by the time I got there. So I asked him, what's going on? He said the plane wasn't functioning well and we really needed a phone. A pilot with three Colombians? That's rare. It's a little fishy, right? He's looking for something. He was trying to find a phone. I brought him to a phone. I'm a good Samaritan, so I offered him a lift. <laughs> Drove us down to the village in Casey. So I had to go down there, and I went to the depender. I dropped them off there. Then I went inside to tell them that the people I picked up needed to use the phone. They talked to Tijan Houdon. Tijan Houdon was the owner. He was set in his ways. He grew up in Casey. He never left Casey. So he was kind of the mayor of the town because there wasn't one. He wasn't a bad guy, but when he started drinking, it could last four to five weeks. And we made phone calls, and I couldn't reach anybody in Montreal. I was trying to find out where the hell these people were. Nobody was answering their phones. So I wasn't very impressed with that. You think somebody could have been monitoring the stupid phone at one point, you know? But no. No, they totally screwed it up from the get-go. Never seen such a bunch of incompetent nymphs in my life. Idiots. The bozo in charge of it decided uh, it was time to leave, and he left at 7.25 in the morning. I would strongly recommend that he doesn't ever cross my path or come anywhere near where I am, because he, he will disappear. And I phoned an air taxi company. They were looking for a place to get another plane, so they called up and took. You know, uh, one of my dispatchers working the morning shift uh, just come in. He was a little edgy when he came in. He told me, Yvonne, oh, I just got a phone call from Casey. They need a plane right now to leave Casey, so they needed to get to Montreal quickly. I was going to wait till the airplane arrived, go have my Colombians get the pilot out of the plane without him seeing me. Yeah, if he'd taken off, uh, too bad for our pilot, but uh, he, he would have gotten off the plane. I don't know how, though. Yeah, you would have stayed in Casey, though. Put him in the conveyor, we'll leave him there, and uh, take four or five bales and a couple of my Colombians and get the hell out of there with his plane. Let the cops find the other guy there, let them figure that one out. The old man from the Depadur with his pickup drove us back up to the runway. And the three Colombians sat in his truck waiting. I walked out on the runway waiting for the Aztec to arrive. By that point, we were on the runway, the two jets, Air Force F-18s, came buzzing over the treetop. <laughs> the noise uh, scared the Colombians, and they took off with the guy's truck. I don't know what the hell they think they were doing, because they had no idea where they were, and you're talking to well, Bush and Canada, they'd never, been, they'd never seen calls like that before, and the guy wondered what the hell was going on. I'm sure Tijan Houdon wasn't okay with all of it. So he takes off. And I'm standing here all by myself. The Colombians are gone. And I'm looking at the airplane and said, I couldn't believe it. It's five tons of cocaine in the darn thing. And I'm standing out here my, on my own. And I'm saying, this, this is not possible. <laughs> it was, I was just stupefied. At Stone Consolidated, we made paper for newspapers. And Cijan called me all of a sudden. He was vulgar. God fucking damn it, the Colombians left with my pickup truck. I said I'd go look around. I looked around the camps. At the bottom of the hill, there was a camp on a sand mound. Once I got down there, I saw Tijan's truck in the ditch. Yeah, they tried to get away, but on the other side of the camp, they drove into the ditch, and they went into the woods on foot. 
I called Tijan and told him, I found your truck. I didn't touch it. He told me the plane was full of drugs. So I thought, ooh. When we got to Casey, the plane was at the end of the runway, so we landed. When we got there and saw the convair, uh, it was uh, bigger than what he had been told. But uh, thankfully, we had the letters, uh, the identification letters. When we saw it, we didn't know if the drugs were still in there or if they were already gone. That's why we decided to go after the pilot and his crew. So we get back into the helicopter and followed the road along the woods. So anyway, after all that rigmarole, I went back to the highway, started hitchhiking again. And a guy came by, picked me up, and off I went, went down, he took me down to the Stone Cold Salt Camp. We followed the road, we could see the consolidated office. And we got off because I had to call my superiors to check in with them. We didn't have communications. The guy, my forced worker, showed up with Raymond Boulanger. So Raymond asked to use the phone, so I let him make a call. I went outside. I tried again to contact the stupid uh, number in Montreal, didn't get anywhere. Yeah. All of a sudden, the helicopter landed at the end of the camp. There was Corporal Peltier. We landed there and uh, we went in to meet the pilot. So I made my way to the office and I saw someone on the phone. He was sitting at the desk and making a call. I was on the phone and the guy looked at me, he said, we need to use the phone. I said, I'll be finished in a second. And I said, who are you? He said, well, I'm, the R I'm the RCMP. I asked, who are you? He said, Raymond Boulanger, I'm the pilot of the airplane. I'm the pilot of the airplane. He said, you're under arrest, you know. <laughs> well, I asked him to specify what plane. He said, the plane on the runway, the one that landed. I said, cool, here, you can use the phone now. <laughs> Cheer, bye. That was it. 18 years of flying for the drug cartels ended here, <laughs> right here. He was done for. Yeah, he'd been caught. You always think that you won't get caught. It's being touted as the biggest drug bust in Canadian history and probably the most dramatic. A story covering two continents, a plane chase, and up to a billion dollars worth of cocaine. The enormous value of the plane's cargo, that's just one part of the story. Another part is where it happened. Casey, Quebec, a remote little community that police say is now the site of the largest drug bust in the country's history. I'll say it like that guy. You never see Casey on maps, but now, thanks to this, maybe one day it will show up on one. <laughs> We got a call from the head of our team, Corporal Barry. He said, listen, we just found the plane. It's in Casey. We'll wait for you. Get over here. You know, such an important seizure and uh, making those arrests, that's a dream come true for an officer working in drug enforcement. But uh, we had to go back to the plane to make sure the drugs stayed there. They were left there unsupervised. Sergeant Rivard left with Mr. Boulanger. Uh, we went back to the airplane. In the meantime, we called the Montreal office because they had asked us to wait for them. They wanted to send people from Montreal, but it was minus 40 degrees out there. We were wearing jeans and light winter jackets, so we decided to go wait in the plane. René didn't think it was a good idea, but I told him we had to. Just to make sure that everything was there. It was there. <laughs> All of it was there. The plane that had come from Colombia was carrying over four tons of cocaine. Good luck, RCMP. The RCMP guy told me what it was worth. It was pure cocaine. It was worth 150 bucks per ounce. That was a lot of money's worth. <laughs> And they all started arriving from all over the place, the army and everything else, and fucking evil. The whole shit show went on. 
With machine guns on each side of the plane. There were armed police officers and it was a huge deal. Uh, that's when they told me, you never know what can happen. Some people had lost money because of the bust. That was their fear, that commandos would show up and just bomb the camp. Cartels are powerful. When we got there, we were shocked. We could see fresh tire marks made by a truck. Since they were fresh, we figured the truck had been waiting for the shipment there. Deschen and Forza were supposed to be at the end of the KC runway when the plane was landing to get the drugs. But as we know, they left sooner. They went back to Montreal. So when he got to contact with his bosses, they told him, what the, where are you? Oh, 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 the airplane wasn't coming. Nobody told you the airplane wasn't coming. Get your ass to hell back up there. So he turned around, he went back up in a pickup truck, him and another guy. Up north like that, uh, the one disadvantage for organizations is that there's only one road. Around 2.30, more RCMP guys showed up. They got in a conal line with their 12 gauges through the windows looking for the Colombians. We went a little further south. And that's when I saw that the footprints going into the woods had been erased with some branches. One of the Colombians tried to erase their footprints in the ground in the snow by using branches. Yeah, that wasn't really effective because you could still see the trail, even if you can't see a footprint. So, uh, not too bright. We went into the woods and followed the trail. The prints looked fresh, and all of a sudden, the prints stopped, and there was a hole. They took off in the forest, and after they found a little, sort of like a little cave type thing, and they were all huddled in there trying to keep warm, they were f almost frozen to death. One of them was in uh, hypothermic shock. If we hadn't found them that night, they would have been dead by morning. After I was arrested, they brought me back at one point to the stone console, and then they picked them up around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The hell do you think you were going? What the hell was all that about? W w do you realize that you're in a country you've never been here? You don't speak the language? You haven't got a clue where you are, geographically speaking? And where, did, where were you planning on going exactly? You know, I uh, didn't know. They weren't happy with that, but anyway, the co-pilot was a bit of an idiot. So the other said, we, we, we didn't want to go, we didn't want to go. I said, okay, it doesn't matter right now. I said, you know you could have died out there? They wanted to strangle the son of a bitch. After dinner, another RCMP guy showed up. He said, Carol, you have to come light something up for me. We're going to search Jean Houdot's truck. All right. So I parked the Oconaline sideways in the middle of the road and lit the truck up. I stayed in the bus and let the guide do his job. All of a sudden, a really nice pickup truck showed up. It looked brand new. It was shiny, like a mirror. When you're working, trucks get dirty. This one was spotless. I flashed the headlights and the RCMP guy came. I said, those guys didn't look like Jesus' children. They had shady faces. He said he'd go check it out. He went to go see them, and they said they were coming back to fix two machines at the two and a half mile mark. They said, we work for console. We're here to fix two machines. No. And I said, I knew all my employees' trucks. If one of them got a new one, I always knew about it right away. They were arrested and charged. There's nothing to think, you know, you just deal with the situation. Ah, shit, you know, okay, what's next, you know? He didn't look like a guy who had just been arrested for smuggling the biggest quantity of cocaine in Canadian history. I found it rather odd. Calm, smiling, cooperative. I should have handcuffed him, but I didn't. I was supposed to, but I didn't. I spent 37 years working at the RCMP in Quebec. I have never seen anyone like him. What are you going to do? You know, there's nothing else you can do. You can stand there and scream and fume and fart. You're there. The deal is done, you know, that's, you're, that's it. The, game, the jig is up, you're over. You just deal with it. 
I'm going to get arrested, I'm going to get charged, and that's it. So deal with it and get it over with as quickly as possible. He seemed to accept the situation. He was arrested and he knew he wasn't going to get himself out of it. So this is what we know. What we're talking about is three tons of cocaine worth over a billion dollars. I got a call uh, one day that the Canadian authorities had captured a Convoy 580 in uh, Casey, Canada. And when I first heard it, I go, Canada? They're going up to Canada? I knew they were going everywhere else. Looked at it, I go, eh. Okay, they'll do anything. We arrived in uh, Quebec to identify the plane. It was pretty obvious that it was most likely one of Avesca's planes, one of Herrera's planes. So I told Chuck to work, I think we have something here. That's what really got me going. I never thought I'd see him in custody. After that time period, the sale of aircraft from the United States to Colombia dropped off considerably. They still would use aircraft, but not to the degree that they had before the Casey incident. You take every victory you can get, and this was quite a victory at the time. The seizure and the fact that everyone involved was uh, being convicted it was definitely a really big accomplishment. It was a dream come true for everyone on the Drug Enforcement Squad. It's fun. It's like in the movies. <laughs> but when nothing goes wrong. The way I look at it, you win some, you lose some. That day I lost, they won. So, big deal. That's the only one I ever lost. Casey is probably the biggest bust I ever worked on in my entire career. It's uh, definitely the biggest drug importation in Canadian history. The seizure in Quebec may be the biggest ever. We determined that there were 4,323 kilos of cocaine worth $2.7 billion in total. Close to three times more than we thought. The biggest cocaine importation in this country's history. Four individuals will respond in court to all sorts of charges. By the time they decided to move us all down to the prison, it was about three or four o'clock in the morning. One person per helicopter. If you could have put all of us in one helicopter, it would have been the same thing. But they had to make the big show. It was the apocalypse. It was like in the movie in Vietnam. It was the same helicopters they used back in Vietnam, too. They had SWAT teams on the roof and things all over the place. And the lights on and the newspaper and the media there. And the helicopters coming in, you know, making a big show like that. Six suspects, three Canadian, three Colombians, were arraigned in court this evening in La Truc. Sit down. Armed to the teeth, about 30 Royal Canadian Mounted Police and Sûreté de Québec officers created an impenetrable barrier, putting in place the highest security measures. But then again, you got to give it to the poor police, the poor guys. They got to get out and play with their toys now and then, you know. And they never really get an opportunity to really shoot at somebody or get all their gear and actually go into action. So it must be a bit frustrating for them. I think our biggest concern was securing the perimeter. We took it seriously. When we got there, there was tons of people already. The room was packed. There was people standing everywhere. It's like a big party. To avoid talking and going to trial and revealing who hired you, people plead guilty and uh, tell us nothing. So the organization just keeps moving forward and on and on, and there you go. And you don't tell. You have contractual agreements, you know. You can't divulge that information because they'll, they'll come after you. <laughs> if you compromise situations, they'll come after you. And they're, they're ruthless. They'll kill you. When we pled guilty, that was it. It was over. We got to leave. We didn't want to stay there any longer than we had to. We got it over with and got out of there. Narcotics trafficking, transport conspiracy. Importation. That was the only charge I got. The Crown wasn't going to just hand out a light sentence. It was out of the question. The sentence had to reflect the gravity of the offense. I got 23 years and my crew got 20 years each. As far as the sentence goes, I feel no pity. I think that 23 years, well, if it were up to me, I would have given more than that. But it's the first time I got arrested for drugs in all the times I've been flying drugs. And I wouldn't have got caught that time if the Italians had been there doing their job. I wouldn't have got caught. 
Today in the Shawinigan Courthouse, surprise, four of them pleaded guilty. The judge sentenced the three Colombians to 20 years, and the Quebecer, Raymond Boulanger, who was the pilot, was sentenced to 23 years. Yes, I'm very pleased. I think that the sentence is appropriate and fair, and given all the circumstances. Yes, there's nothing to freak out about. It's just a sentence in front of a judge. It's no big deal. You know what they did with judges in Colombia? You know what I mean? You either walk away or boom. The system didn't put you in there. You put yourself in there, so deal with it. That's all part of it. What else is there to say? Just get on with it. Deal with the sentence. You know, you went in and you did it. Do your time now. Sit. it. So he got a 23-year prison sentence, but people aren't going to remember the actual sentence. They brought us from the cell downstairs, up the stairs, and when they opened the door, there was a corridor there. I couldn't count. It was a whole maze of journalists, click, 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 and taking pictures and stuff like that. And the Colombians and the other guys were all hiding their faces. What are you, pussy? Don't care. I'm not going to hide my face. I'm not ashamed of what I do. So I just winked at them, and that was it. I saw Raymond just like I'd always known him. He was a charmer, even in handcuffs. He had a nice smile on. That was the Raymond Boulanger I knew. My sense of humor, what are you gonna do? He was boastful. He liked it, he really did. He liked getting the attention. He would have been a good movie star. <laughs> I could have flipped the bird at him, I didn't. My mom said, that's not polite. Hey, yeah, so you caught me, you caught me, big deal. <laughs> you know, there's, that's all. Donna Kona is the largest penitentiary in Quebec. Inmates have committed violent crimes, murders, attempted murders, drug importation, organized crime. It's really, really a dangerous place. It's scary, it's violent. You got some pretty heavy duty criminals and stuff in there, but not all murderers. Got rapists, lots of those. But, you know, whatever, you know. The time I was here, I saw seven murders. It isn't known, but the police are after him because his halfway house has not heard from him. You don't want to give me parole? I'll parole myself. 